Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. I welcome you all to today's Hindu newspaper analysis. I'm so glad to see that all of you have been joining in right here on time to attend these live sessions. Also, I hope that you all have been taking advantage of our Target Prelims 2023 series that is right now going on on our Baiju's Exam Prep app where we are discussing important topics from each and every subject. I hope your preparation is going fine. Please make sure that if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel till now, do hit the subscribe button. Also take advantage of all our other initiatives on the Baiju Exam Prep app as well by downloading that app. Now, let's see what are the important articles that we have here for you today. As you know, we will be discussing articles from both the mains examination point of view as well as the prelims examination point of view. The three articles from the mains point of view that we will analyze very deeply are number one about AUKUS and Australia. As you know, AUKUS right now is a trilateral agreement between Australia, UK and US. It's a defense agreement mainly formed under which Australia will be held by these two Western countries to acquire state of the art nuclear submarines. We'll be discussing what exactly is the progress on AUKUS right now and most importantly, what are the lessons India can learn from what is going on in AUKUS. The second topic for today will be about widening rift. That is a topic of widening rift between USA and China. As you know, the two superpowers right now have been criticizing each other on a number of issues, including the balloon issue, including the, you, the support to Russia that China has been giving. All these issues have now come up so much in the open that the two sides are criticizing each other. In this article, we will be discussing what are the measures that the two sides can take to come closer to each other and what is India's role here. The third article will be on India US deciding to launch a semiconductor subcommittee to give a push to semiconductor production in India. Then we'll move on to prelims facts specifically. A lot of news articles in today's newspaper are important for the prelims examination. For example, the front page carries a news about H3N2 flu virus that has unfortunately claimed two lives. We'll be discussing a bit about that virus. Then we'll be going ahead with women's reservation bill that again is in the news with the BRS that was earlier TRS. They are now protesting, demanding that a women's reservation bill should go ahead. Then we'll be discussing about how government has changed certain KYC norms. Then there's a Niti Aayog report that has come out about the importance of goshalas and cow shelters. And in the end, the last article that we'll be discussing would be about the urban local body polls in the state of Nagaland. So we have a lot on our plate today. This is how we'll be covering the entire Hindu newspaper. So let's not delay it any further. Let's begin with the very first article that we have here for you. The first article is about AUKUS. Now, before we go deeper into AUKUS and what Australia is doing, please understand, if you look at the past few years, you will see Australia has actually become quite active. Australia has realized that their geography, which they thought is a biggest advantage, no country can come to Australia, no country can attack them, that advantage is now going away. How? China is becoming more and more assertive. In the Pacific Ocean, there are many small island nations which are very close to Australia. Those island nations are now coming under influence of China. China and Australia in the past few years have not been on great terms. China has even accused Australia that you are not giving the complete respect that the Chinese companies deserve that are working in Australia. So in short, Australia has realized that they cannot remain secluded now. Australia now also wants to become a part of multiple international groupings in order to counter the Chinese threat. And that is why we know Australia is a part of COD also. It is a part of AUKUS as well. And they are now actively trying to sign as many agreements with as many nations as possible. As you know, the Australian Prime Minister, in fact, is in India right now. He and our Prime Minister was at the Ahmedabad Cricket Stadium when the fourth test match between the two sides got started. So Australia is now becoming more and more active in the world affairs. This is where AUKUS also comes into the picture. A few years back, Australia decided that in order to tackle the Chinese threat, they require much better, much more advanced submarines. 
So initially, Australia plays an order with France, asking France to give them some nuclear submarines. After that, they cancelled the order and it was decided by Australia that we will rather get supply of submarines from US and UK. And that is how the AUKUS group came into being. Australia, UK and US. The objective of the group was that UK and US will ensure that they supply nuclear submarines to Australia and they also share technology with Australia. Now over here, please understand, when I say nuclear submarines, please understand nuclear submarines are of two types. One, nuclear submarines would be those that have nuclear weapons. Those submarines that can launch nuclear weapons. And the second one is nuclear powered submarines. Nuclear powered submarines means they are running on nuclear energy. Right now, when we are talking about Australia importing submarines from US and UK, we mean to say nuclear powered submarines and not the ones with nuclear weapons. Please do make a note of this. All this agreement, all this fact that Australia will get submarines from UK and US, they are nuclear powered and not nuclear weapons as such. Now what is happening is, although this agreement has been signed, but even then after signing of the agreement, Australia has not been able to get those submarines from US and UK. Australia right now is facing a lot of threat from China. Not a direct threat, but as I told you, a lot of very small island nations nearby Australia are now under influence of China, with China investing a lot of money. So Australia wants to expedite that agreement. Australia wants that as soon as possible, they should get their hands on the submarine. But that is not what is happening. Now, why exactly is this? There are a lot of problems. The first big problem that we have is with the US. See, US, as we know, is the world's biggest superpower. They also have the most advanced military weapon technology. Although US has signed an agreement with Australia, we will give you submarines. But US has very strict laws about weapon export, especially when it comes to nuclear technology. If the US has to export any weapon which has nuclear technology attached to it, it is very, very, very difficult. The process has to go through multiple stages. The Senate also, that is the upper house, also has to say yes, only then this agreement will go ahead. So USA right now is not being able to go through the Senate. The Senate is not really in favor of giving as such technology to Australia. So first option, getting directly from USA, that option does not really seem to be feasible for Australia. The second option is that they can get this from UK. The problem with UK is UK also has these submarines, but the way that the UK submarines work are very different as compared to how the other submarines in Australia work. See, understand something. Let's assume the Indian government wants to buy an airplane and uh, fighter aircraft from France. Let's say we buy the Rafale jets. Now, when the Rafales are in India and when they are operated by our Air Force, they are used along with other aircrafts. They don't just go alone. There are other aircrafts as well. Some of them will provide them technical input. Some of them will have much better radar system, surveillance system. So if the Indian Air Force is flying, let's say, three types of aircrafts, all of them should be compatible with each other so that they can share each other's information. They can help each other when they are in trouble. The same is the case with this submarine issue as well. Australia already has a lot of submarines. When they acquire some new submarines, ideally that new submarine should also be compatible with how the Australian submarines are. This is the problem with UK. If UK gives their submarines, they would not really be compatible with how Australian submarines work. So this option is also out. The first option, getting it from US out because the Senate is not really expediting the process. Second option for Australia, getting it from UK also out because UK submarines are different. Third option then would be that Australia makes its own submarines with technology coming in from US and UK. That would be ideal that US and UK technology will come in and Australia will make its own submarines. But this is very easy to say, but very difficult to actually do. How? As you know, the submarines that we are talking about 
are actually nuclear powered submarines whenever there is any nuclear technology exchange when one country gives the other country any technology res with respect to nuclear it becomes very 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 difficult for various reasons a lot of treaties come in the picture treaties such as the npt have you signed the npt or not do you have permission from the other countries to import uranium or not should we be able to give you technology or not all these things become very very vital then we also have the international atomic energy agency that will look into which country is giving nuclear technology to which country so in short there are a lot of bureaucratic hurdles just signing the agreement just making occurs a reality doesn't really mean that the submarines will go from one country to other that easily it takes a lot of negotiations even after the agreement is signed and this is where there are lessons for india as well what are the lessons for india india as you know has been trying to sign multiple agreements with us in fact just a few weeks back if you remember india and us signed an agreement about icet do you remember that do you remember icet the agreement that india had signed with us very recently that agreement was that india and us will share critical technologies remember that india can expect a lot of critical technology being shared from us us would also help india in going ahead and experimenting and researching in a lot of new areas this is where india has to learn the lesson if you compare india and australia australia is considered as a better friend of us australia in fact has signed multiple treaties with us do you know australia does not have any nuclear power plants Australia has been given a guarantee by the US that you don't have to work on nuclear technology we will help you if it is required so australia is a better friend of us even then australia is getting such a hard time in importing that technology from us so just imagine what will happen with india the author says india is not a treaty bound friend of the us yes we have good relationship but we don't have any treaty as such with the us so we have signed agreements such as this but india has to understand we cannot depend on us because transfer of technology from us is extremely rigid there is a lot of red tape there are a lot of bureaucratic hurdles and it is very very difficult for india to actually go ahead and take technology from us rather than that it would be easier for india to get in touch with other countries such as france with france France is much more open to exchanging these kind of technologies with India. For example, even the Rafale attack, uh, the fighter jets. Rafale is one of the best fighter jets in the world. France was ready to give it to India. USA, on the other hand, usually does not sell their best fighter jets to any country. They say that no, this is just for us. We'll not sell it to any other air force. So with USA, transfer of technology is not that easy. so if india also wants to take similar kind of engines for the submarines that work on nuclear technology it is better to go ahead with france rather than going ahead with us india also as you know has not signed the npt we are not a part of the nuclear non proliferation treaty so in order for that to actually not be a hurdle the good option for india is to go ahead with france and not the us that is what the author suggest now about aukus there are a few things that you must remember as i told you aukus mainly is a security arrangement that consists of three countries australia uk and us it came into being because australia wanted nuclear powered submarines first they decided to take it from france then they cancelled the order then they gave the order to us uk and that is how the aukus group was formed the aukus group officially does not say that we are against china but china believes that it is anti china it is trying to control the powers of china in the indo pacific as per the aukus nuclear submarines will be transferred to australia as i told you earlier and i'll repeat once again when i say nuclear submarines nuclear submarines are of two types nuclear powered which run on nuclear energy and nuclear attack we are talking about nuclear powered submarines now one other question is why are nuclear powered submarines so important for any country 
Why is it that submarines which run on nuclear power are so important? Let's try and understand this. There are mainly two types of submarines. Let's say one is powered by diesel. And other is powered by nuclear. The main difference is if it is a nuclear powered submarine, it can stay under water for a long, long time. For 80 to 85 days, it can come or it can remain underwater without having to come on the surface. As you know, the biggest advantage of a submarine is it remains underwater. So it is very, very difficult to detect. Now, when you have submarine that is underwater for a long time, difficult to detect, that means it can go anywhere in the world, it can go near your enemy country also, can see what the enemies are doing. On the other hand, when you have diesel powered, the problem is number one, they have to come on the surface after every 15-20 days. They also make a lot more noise as compared to the nuclear powered submarines. So nuclear powered submarines don't really have any noise. They can remain underwater for a long, long time. So they give you a lot more protection, lot more stealth. And the entire advantage of a submarine is that it is very hard to detect. If it has to come on the surface, then the entire logic of submarine gets defeated. And that is why the countries around the world want nuclear powered submarines now. Right now, which countries around the world have nuclear powered submarines? India. US, UK, France, Russia and China. These are the countries that already have nuclear powered submarines. So India is also one of them. Australia also wants to join the same and that is why they are taking this submarine from US or UK. Now, I have here for you two extremely important infographics for you to revise a lot of things related to the Indo-Pacific region. In the Indo-Pacific region, as you know, as China is expanding, China is giving a lot of loan to very small nations, island nations to put them under pressure. Many nations, especially Western nations, US, etc. have formed multiple groupings in this area to ensure that China's expansion is curtailed. So there is AUKUS, then there's also ANZ-US Treaty called Australia-New Zealand-US Treaty. There is COD, I'm sure all of you know. There's also something called the Five Eyes Alliance. Five Eyes Alliance is US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. That is to share intelligence information with each other. So it is not just AUKUS. There are many countries that are coming together in multiple groupings in the Indo-Pacific to stop the expansion of China. As you can see here, the location of Australia makes it very, very safe they believe that since the other countries are far away from their mainland, they will not be able to come and attack Australia. But because these small island nations are now coming under influence of China, Australia is worried that Chinese presence in this area of the Pacific Ocean is increasing and they do not want the same to happen. That is why Australia now is extremely active in joining multiple groups and signing multiple agreements with nations such as India and US. This was the first write-up. Before I go on to a second write-up, let me see if there are any questions and then we'll go ahead. <clears throat> okay, Kishan has a question. Kishan is saying, what is the objective of AUKUS? Even USA does not want to share is AUKUS losing its relevance. It's too easy or too early to say they are losing their relevance. See, AUKUS is a group that just came into being a couple of years back. Whenever you form any group, about transfer of technology takes time. For example, let's say if India signs an agreement with any other country that will give you some technology. The first step, as you know, is the government will sign the agreement. The second step is the parliament has to ratify it. So the parliament ratifies, then there are a lot of permissions that have to be taken within the country. So it's usually a long process. Over here, I would say rather than USA slowing it down, Australia is in a lot of hurry right now. Because they think the threat from China is imminent and they cannot wait. Yes, USA should have done this earlier, but US historically has been extremely slow, especially when it comes to sharing of technology. So I would not say they are already losing their relevance. It's just a couple of years old. We'll have to see whether the US actually goes ahead and gives this kind of technology or not. Uh, all those who are asking about the PDF of these videos, when you look at the description of the video, 
uh, on YouTube, look at the description, you will get a link to download the PDF and you can download that from there. Okay, I'll, I'll take one or two more questions. Can Australia cancel the deal? <laughs> it depends on agreement to agreement. Obviously, uh, they have different kind of provisions. When can you cancel? When can you not cancel? So that's not that easy. Uh, Sikandar asking why Australia canceled the deal with France. So uh, the story is Australia thought they are getting a better deal, a better feature of sub submarines from US, UK. Also, when they canceled the order from France, France was very, very angry. In fact, the French president uh, d did speak a lot of things against USA. They said that USA is a NATO ally. They should not have done this to us. They cooled down after a few months, but France and USA also did not have great time when, Ch when Australia canceled this deal. Okay, let's go ahead then. Uh, one more difference between nuclear power and nuclear weapon. Nuclear powered submarine is that runs on, so there's a small generator within the submarine. It will generate energy through nuclear fuel. That is a nuclear powered submarine. Nuclear weapon submarine means that can shoot nuclear weapons. That is a difference. Let's go ahead then. The second important article is again with respect to US and China. See, as you know, US and China have always been countries which are not very close friends to each other. Ever since the Second World War, ever since the Communist Party took over China in 1940s, USA and China have never been on good terms. But what has changed is in the past couple of decades, the growth that China has shown to the entire world. China, everyone now believes, is the second top global power in the world. Gone are the days when USA and Russia were the two top superpowers. Now it is USA and China. So everyone believes that China right now is gaining a lot of power, a lot of influence. Earlier also when US and China used to have their differences, they used to criticize each other but not very openly. What has happened is in the past few years, US and China have started openly taking their names and openly blaming each other. That is what has changed. Recently you saw how there was this spy balloon incident where US said that there are multiple spy balloons flying over US coming in from China. Those balloons were shot down. China did not take it lightly. China said, no, these are just meteorological balloons. Why are you blaming us for this? So all these issues have now made China and the US come face to face. The Ukraine-Russia war ever since that has started, China has supported Russia. China also remains a threat to Taiwan. So there are a lot of issues because of it. The US and China right now are facing an unprecedented crisis. They are face to face with each other. However, there is one other interesting part. We think that because US and China are not on good terms with each other, maybe they are not trading, but that is not the case. The trade between US and China still is booming. It's hundreds of billions of dollars of trade between US and China. In fact, there is a joke in USA that sometimes in USA, if you order something from China, it will reach you faster as compared to if you order something from some other US state. So much is the trade between US and China right now. So on one hand, yes, they are facing each other. On one hand, yes, they are criticizing each other. But on the other hand, the trade still is booming between the two sides. Recently, Xi Jinping, who has started his third term now, which is unprecedented, said, that they are facing challenges to the country's development because Western countries led by the US have implemented their containment and suppression of China. Again, these kind of open statements were not made earlier. For example, the difference is earlier, he would have said that Western countries are attacking us. Western countries is a generic term. But now when you say Western country led by the US are attacking us, that means you are openly holding US responsible for any problem that you are facing. In fact, their foreign minister also said that US was trying to encircle China. US is trying to criticize China for no fault of theirs. Recently, as you know, the American Secretary of State had to visit China. That visit was also cancelled because of the balloon incident. Some months back, you know that the US speaker, that is Nancy Pelosi, came to Taiwan when China objected. China did not want her to come to Taiwan because China believes that no foreign dignitary, especially of a big country, should come to Taiwan because China believes that Taiwan is their part only. So all these issues now 
have come in the open. China have openly speaking about cord also. China has in fact openly speaking about against AUKUS as well. They think that all these groupings in the region, in the Indo-Pacific especially, are against China. Now, there is something very interesting that is happening. On one hand, China and US relationship is deteriorating day by day. On the other hand, China is also making new friends. As you know, China, Russia are now closer than ever. They keep on making the statement that we are the best friends ever. We'll give our life for each other. In fact, China's relationship with Japan is also slightly improving day by day. So USA is not liking the fact that China is also making new friends. Now, there's something very interesting that happened just a few days back. I don't know how many of you have actually noticed this. Just a few days back, we saw that US government released a report, a report by US intelligence agencies. So US has multiple intelligence agencies working in different sectors. All these agencies come together and every year they bring an annual report about the entire world. So recently also the US intelligence report came out. This report talked about India as well. This report talked about other countries, Russia as well. But this report mainly talked about China. What did this report say? This report said that, for example, China in the space sector will compete with US side by side by 2030. China also is trying to expand its powers. The same report says. In fact, there are experts in this area. For example, Alexander Gobev is considered as an expert in this area. He works at a very well-known think tank. He also tweeted after this report that ever since Ukraine-Russia war has broken, China's trade with Russia has increased considerably, close to 30%. Meaning that China is now also trying to find out new friends. And USA's intelligence report now understand that China can be a threat and China is expanding in many areas. I'll give you a few examples. There are two areas where the entire world right now is focusing. One area is solar and the other area is semiconductor. Solar technology and semiconductor chips. These are two areas where the entire world is focusing right now. As per this US intelligence report, and I have taken this line exactly from the report. It's a small report, short report, about 30 pages. You can download it online. It's very easily available. From this report, you can see it says that China is right now controlling a 65% of lithium ion battery market by 2025. 65% of the world global market of lithium ion controlled by China. This is such a huge number. When they have such a big market control, they can decide the pricing, they can decide which country will get the supply, which country will not get the supply. The report also says that China produces 40% of the world's API. API, as you know, is the ingredient of medicines. Although India makes a lot of medicines, we are dependent on China for the import of raw material called the APIs. China's global share in manufacturing of solar panels exceeds 80%. Just imagine, five, four out of every five solar panels made in the world are made in China. India right now is expanding our solar energy capacity. Most of the solar panels that we need are being imported from China. So China right now controls so many of these important technologies that are required by nations from all around the world. That is why China's importance is increasing. So US is also realizing this fact that China's capacity in semiconductor, in solar, in lithium ion, all of this is increasing and we have to make sure that they put a break on this. India also has been trying to do the same. We'll talk about India's semiconductor push as well in just a little bit when we discuss this particular article. Any other question? Let me quickly see. There's a question. Uh, there are two questions about the war actually. One question is which side will Russia take if a war breaks out between India and China? <laughs> UA, UPSC does not ask you hypothetical questions. So I would also suggest you Let's not talk about hypothetical question. What if this happens? What if that happens? Any question that starts with what if is not important. Then I have a question. 
it seemed like increasing tug of war between US and China is a failure of UN. Can you can I mention this answer? You can, but again, US and China both are permanent members of the Security Council. It's not as much of a failure of UN as such because UN does not really have the responsibility to ensure that these bilateral relationships are maintained. Yes, it can be considered as a failure of diplomacy at the international level. There are multiple organizations like WTO, etc. that should have come in between. So it's more of a failure of WTO not being able to resolve these kind of differences more than UN. But yes, you can blame the US as well, don't worry. Uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients basically are those in ingredients or those components using which you make medicine like paracetamol when country like India makes paracetamol we import the raw material from China let's go ahead then the next article that we have here is about India and US deciding to launch a semiconductor subcommittee as you know uh, from the US their uh, secretary of department of commerce is in India in fact there were a lot of pictures of her with Indian ministers playing holy and having a good time in India there are multiple meetings that are now being held between India and US on multiple issues. One of these meetings has actually resulted in India and US deciding to launch a semiconductor subcommittee. Now this is kind of related to the last article that we just discussed. Since the world is going digital, almost everything around you has some semiconductor chip. If you're watching me on your phone or on your laptop, wherever it has many semiconductor chips, what your fan, your car, your refrigerator, your microwave oven, almost every single thing around you right now has a lot of semiconductor chips. How? Re remember when we used to be kids, the size of the television. If this is a television screen, the size of the television used to be this big. These were the CRT monitors. They used to be so thick. Now you see the screens of television is this much. It has better technology even in this much of a screen, even if the screen is this wide, you still have better speaker, you still have better sound quality, you still have better video quality. A lot of that is because of the advancement in the semiconductor chips. Because the semiconductor chips have become so advanced, they have become so compact that we are now able to make much more compact devices as compared to earlier. The mobile phone that you have today is much stronger, it is much more intelligent as compared to the huge computers that were made 20-30 years back. 20-30 years back we used to have huge computers in the entire room. Now one phone that you have is even stronger than that entire computer because again the semiconductor chips have made it possible. Now we also realize the importance of semiconductor chips if you remember when the Ukraine Russia war started and even before that when we had the COVID-19 crisis especially there was a disruption in the semiconductor chip supply because most of the semiconductor chips come from Taiwan come from China because of that when the global supply chain was not working the entire world was facing the shortage of semiconductor chips. A couple of years back in India if you went to buy any car there was a waiting of eight months, even one year. Even right now, there is still a waiting, although the situation has improved considerably. But a couple of years back, if you wanted to buy a car, you had to wait for one year. Why? Simply because the semiconductor chips that had to come in from China, from Taiwan, were just not coming. So that was a time in the pandemic in 2020, especially when countries around the world realize that they have to focus on semiconductor chips. USA has realized this earlier as well. They have been investing a lot of money in their semiconductor chips. In fact, USA and China have this ongoing war of semiconductor chips also. A few months back, the US president gave an order that high-tech chips cannot be exported from US to China. So US and China are, are on a different level when it comes to making semiconductor chips. In India also now what is happening is India also is now trying to focus a lot on making semiconductor chips. But the problem is it is very easy to say but it's very difficult to actually make these kind of semiconductor chips because of various reasons and we'll come to that also in just a bit. What has happened is US and India has decided to make this committee where we will help each other with supply chains with sourcing of material from different countries, facilitating clean technology, etc. So that India's semiconductor industry can get a boost. 
but we just read in the first article today itself with us it is very easy to make a committee but transfer of technology from us takes a lot of time see think of it from the us point of view what us is, does is usa wants that you can buy whatever you want from us usa says do you want semiconductor chips okay give us the money we will supply but we will not tell you how to make it because if we tell you how to make it tomorrow you will not buy from us that is how us always thinks that if they start sharing their technology how to make the chips how to make fighter aircraft how to make submarines then the countries will make it themselves why would they come back to us to buy it so us is usually always very very doubtful when they come when it comes to sharing of technology we saw this in terms of australia as well and with this committee as well anyways this article is just about that committee but it is important for us to understand the push that the government of india is giving to semiconductor industry in india because since the covid-19 pandemic every country around the world has realized its importance the indian government has announced multiple programs for example right now because india imports almost all the chips that we use the import bill can reach up to 100 billion dollars by 2025 which is a big worry it is a big drain on our foreign exchange as well so the government of india recently allocated 76000 crore for supporting semiconductor industries in india but the problem is semiconductor industry setting up such industry is so 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 expensive that this 76000 crore of 1 billion dollars will not be anything you require tens of billions of dollars to set up such industries so this much will not really be enough we also have launched the scheme for promotion of manufacturing of electronic components and semiconductors our ministry of electronics and information technology launched the digital linked incentive scheme to give incentive to those companies trying to set up such plants but again it is extremely difficult because such industries require a lot of money they also require a lot of investment and apart from that they require a lot of expertise as well india right now does not have any expertise in this countries such as taiwan china south korea usa japan they have been investing in this for such a lot long time that they have now gained mastery over it for us to now start and then think that in just a few months we will be able to master it that is very very difficult there are many challenges that we are facing in expanding this industry for example first very high investment is required very very high and when you have such a high investment that is required companies usually try and get help from the government the government is expected that you should invest more money however from the government side also we have certain limitations government cannot keep spending so much money in these kind of industries because we have to spend money in healthcare in education in defense budget as well second problem lack of fabrication capacity now fabrication basically means when you have this chip if you have any ever opened up a phone even if you open up a let's say a uh, uh, television laptop even when you open up your fm radios you will see certain semiconductor chips now to plant all of them into one single board so if let's say if you have this board over that you plant certain small chips planting that precisely will be called fabrication now fabrication also is a very very difficult task to do it requires a lot of precision it requires a lot of expertise we do have isro and drdo which have certain fabrication labs but they are not up to that level in india right now we only have one fabrication lab that is the one that is present in mohali in punjab we are trying to set up more but again setting up these fabrication labs is also very 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 expensive not just this is one other problem that we don't really realize that problem is that these industries also require a lot of power and land and clean water as well these kind of industries have a huge requirement of very stable power water supply that is clean water india again has so much pressure that our land that our ground level water is decreasing we cannot divert so much water into such kind of industries so all of that remains a huge problem for india we have started it it will be a gradual process but we should not expect that overnight we will have such a major change 
that we will automatically become the leader in semiconductor industry that will not happen on that note this is time for now focusing on prelims specific news stories from today's indian express newspaper sorry today's hindu newspaper now if you look at the front page of the hindu newspaper the front page carries this news that h3n2 flu has claimed two lives as per the health ministry disease based questions are asked consistently in the prelims examination whenever you have a disease based question it is always advisable to remember three or four things about that you have to remember about what exactly is the disease caused by symptoms if there are any special symptoms the origin of this virus etc that would be good enough for example the h3n2 virus is a influenza virus i have discussed this earlier as well influenza viruses are of different types so we have a b c and d these are four types of influenza viruses influenza a again is divided into different categories out of that one category is h3n2 and i will show a table also in just a bit so that you are able to remember how many types of influenza viruses there are the symptoms are very similar to other types of flu that people usually catch cough fever body aches sore throat etc we have seen nausea vomiting as well this virus usually lasts for 5 to 7 days and it may go away if you have good immunity but if you are vulnerable means your body has low immunity if you already are carrying multiple serious diseases then you become more and more susceptible to such a virus as per the ima that is the indian medical association this usually impacts individuals below the age of 15 or above the age of 50 so i'm assuming almost all of you are safe from this but it is still a threat especially for those people who have comorbidities means who are suffering from other types of serious diseases this is a table which i would like all of you to try and pay some attention to because multiple influenza viruses have been in the news this year for various purposes so make sure that you know what are the different types of viruses how exactly are they categorized influenza a b c d influenza a has these subtypes the most common for humans is h1n1 and h3n2 h3n2 is the one which now has become problematic there are different names given to these viruses depending on their origin story for example h3n2 virus is called the hong kong influenza it is based on the origin story wherever it originated it was in 1968 we have h2n2 h1n1 as well so there are different types of viruses depending upon their composition that are given different names and depending on their origin story i would highly urge you advise you to make sure that you do download these pdfs that we discussed so that you can revise it very easily and make sure for the prelims examination you are able to solve most of these questions also this is a mid class reminder that as soon as this session ends on our telegram channel you know we have a quiz every single day based on these articles only that we are discussing so do make it a point to attend those quizzes as well so that you can revise exactly whatever you are studying here the next important prelims specific information from here from today's article is about the women's reservation bill now women's reservation bill is not something which is passed or introduced recently as you know ever since municipalities and panchayats were given a constitutional status in india in panchayats and municipalities we have one third women reservation ever since then we have had a demand that in parliament also we should have similar reservation so many years back there was a bill introduced which said that there should be at least one third seats reserved for women in the parliament that was called the women reservation bill it has not been passed so far it was first introduced in rajya sabha in may 2008 it then went to a standing committee in 2010 it passed in rajya sabha then it went to lok sabha then lok sabha tenure got over and the bill got lapsed since then it has been over a decade and we have not had discussion on this bill so far many people say that this bill should be reintroduced we should give one third reservation to women in the parliament there are various reasons for that for example one big reason that many people say we should have more women in the parliament is that more women means 
more women friendly laws there will be more women friendly laws there will be more gender equality when you give more representation to women more representation to diverse groups it gives a good signal to the people that yes more people are invited in the parliament however there is a counter argument here and listen to this very carefully let us assume that there are many women in the Lok Sabha there are many women members and there is a bill that is introduced and the bill is not in favor of women. Let's just take an example that the bill is against the interest of women. But even then, as you know, we have anti-defection law. Meaning that even if the women members of parliament do not want to vote in favor of the bill, they will still have to vote in favor of the bill if their party gives them the order. You do understand this, right? The anti-defection law says you cannot vote against your party. So if you are a women member of parliament, you do not like a bill, you think it is against the rights of the women, even then you will have to vote for the bill just because your party told you to. In short, what I want to explain here is just increasing the number of women in the parliament automatically will not mean that more women friendly laws will be passed. As long as we ensure that the women members are able to vote from their own mind through their own freedom only then we can expect that more and more laws in favor of women will be passed so just increasing number of women will not really have that impact this bill has asked for 33 percent reservation for women in Lok Sabha and in legislative assemblies around the country as well so far it has not happened the good part is right now if you look at the Lok Sabha we have a lot of women members when I say a lot I mean as compared to previous Lok Sabhas but even then we still don't even have 15 percent membership or 15 percent representation in the Lok Sabha 33 percent is very very far not even 15 percent representation is given in the Lok Sabha to women many political parties say the reason is that even when we give ticket to women candidates they don't win election so maybe people themselves don't want to vote for women candidates. So rather than making it compulsory from the side of the government, why not educate the voters that vote for more women candidates, obviously they will get to Lok Sabha. So this is a bigger problem. It cannot just be solved by ensuring that there are 33% seats reserved for women. Another connection to this story is India's position, the global gender gap report. So the global gender gap report as the name suggests tells about the gap between the two genders in various fields. For example in the 2022 report India got a better score as compared to some other countries in terms of political empowerment. India as you know is one of those countries where we do not discriminate on the basis of gender when it comes to voting or when it comes to contesting elections. Women are as free to contest as men are. Women are as free to vote in the elections as the men are. So in terms of political empowerment, India does fare better. But still, we are at 48th position when it comes to political empowerment of women. Means we have much lesser number of women in the parliament than we should have. In comparison, Bangladesh has a rank of 9. Just imagine. Around the entire world, Bangladesh has a rank of 9 when it comes to women empowerment. So, as you can see, they are Prime Minister for many, many years. There have been multiple women who have become Prime Ministers in Bangladesh. Awami League is led by Sheikh Hasina. So, again, women empowerment in Bangladesh has been much better as compared to India. This was the gender gap report of 2022. As you can see, in political empowerment, India still got a better score. As you can see here. In political empowerment, our score was still better as compared to many other countries. But in terms of other aspects, economic opportunity, our rank is 143. Education, 107. Health survival, 146. Something that we need to work on. On political empowerment, we have a better score. But again, this is something that needs to be improved. You can take an example of Bangladesh itself. The next prelims worthy article is the government ruling according to which the KYC norms have to be made more stronger. The KYC norms also have to include NPOs that is non-profit organizations, 
PEP politically exposed persons and those who are investing in virtual digital assets. Now, what does it mean exactly? Let's try and understand. What is KYC? KYC is know your customer. Know your customer. So when you go to a bank, you want to open up a bank account, they will ask you for certain documentation. Aadhaar card, PAN card, photo, address proof, etc, etc. That is called KYC. So they take documents about you to verify information about you so that they can know about you. Similarly, there are many apps. Let's say if you want to invest in mutual funds, if you want to invest in stocks, shares, etc. When you make an account on the app, they will ask you for certain documentation that is called KYC. The government has said that from now onwards, when customers are doing their KYC, the organizations also have to ask them, number one, are you a politically exposed person or not? Politically exposed person means, are you someone who is working for the government? Are you someone who is working for a government company? Are you someone who has an important political party position or not? That is called a politically exposed person. So companies will have to ask you, number one, are you a politically exposed person or not? Second, the companies will also ask you, are you a non-profit organization or not? And thirdly, the company will also ask you, are you someone who invest money in virtual digital assets or not? Virtual digital assets means, are you someone who buys cryptocurrency? Are you someone who buys NFT? Are you someone who buys these online tokens, etc? If answer to this is yes, then you have to tell all these financial companies where you are investing money or where you are investing any of the assets. So the KYC norms now onwards will have to include this, these three pointers as well. Number one, are you a politically exposed person? Number two, are you from a non-profit organization? Or number three, are you investing in these digital assets or not? This information about the customer has to be stored for at least five years. For at least five years, the company will have to keep a record of all this information. If the government wants, they can ask for it. Any transaction above 10 lakh rupees will have to be reported to financial intelligence unit of the government. So if there is a politically exposed person, a non-profit organization or someone who invests in digital assets, if they are investing more than 10 lakh rupees, the company has to inform government's financial intelligence unit so that that can be tracked. All this is being done so that we can prevent money laundering. PMLA, as you know, is Prevention of Money Laundering Act. All this is being done to prevent money laundering, to prevent black money, illegal money from being used in some other transactions. The government has also said that if any one of these people has ownership of 10% or more than 10% in any company, they will also have to report it to the government. So the laws have been made more stringent, more strict. Earlier, if these people owned 25% or more than 25% of any entity, then the government should have to be informed. Now, even if you own 10% or more than 10%, the government would have to be informed about this. These are the examples of virtual assets. When you say people investing in virtual assets, that includes cryptocurrency. There are gaming tokens that many companies run. There are also NFTs, non-fungible tokens. I hope all of you have now understood what are NFTs. I'll give you a simple example of an NFT. So NFT can be any digital file or digital data that is originally with you. I'll give you a simple example. So. In 2011, India won the World Cup. We all saw how MS Dhoni hit a six on the last ball. The video of that ball, MS Dhoni hitting a six, that video is available on the YouTube, online, everywhere. Everyone would have seen this. Many people would have seen this originally as well on the TV. However, when that video was being made, only one single camera in the stadium would have actually captured that shot. The original camera that would have captured that shot. The original film from that camera, the original file. If you own that, that will be called NFT. 
So NFT would be that I own something that is original. Yes, there may be copies present everywhere, but I exclusively own that. That is called NFT, non-fungible token. That can be any painting also, that something that can be copied or has been copied, but you only own the original part. Many people now collect the NFT, they sell it, there is auctioning that happens with NFT. All these things are a part of the virtual assets. Let me see if there are any questions quickly. All KYCs only for government authorization will contain NPOs. The KYCs are for government only. The government keeps a track. Government wants to know which non-profit organization, which politically exposed person and which of these people who are, uh, who are investing in cryptocurrency, where are they investing money, how much are they investing. That is the only purpose. Then I have a question from Lotus. Please repeat what is politically exposed person. I have written this here for you to understand. Politically exposed person is defined as this. So anyone who works at a prominent position in a government company, anyone who is a head of the state, head of the government, any senior politician, any senior judicial person, any senior military officer also will be called a politically exposed person. This is the definition given by the government word by word. Even important political party officials, even though if they are not a part of the government, even then they will be considered as a politically exposed person. Okay. Perfect. Then. Let's move on. The next important news for prelims point of view is Niti Aayog has just given a report. That report is titled Production and Promotion of Organic and biofertilizers with special focus on improving economic viability of Goshalas. Long title of the report. In simple terms, the report says the government should focus on making more Goshalas or cow shelters because it will have multiple advantages. First big advantage, if we have more cow shelters, we will we can use the cow dung as fertilizers for natural farming. Number one. Secondly, because more and more farmers are now going towards organic farming, they want manure that is natural, so it can be a good business as well. There are many state governments, in fact, do you know, which have started a scheme that they will buy cow dung from the farmers. In fact, let, us, let this be your homework. Please tell me in the comment section of the video, which state government in India started this scheme that they will buy cow dung from the farmers and they will give them money in return. So that the government can then use it or give it to the farmers or then distribute it. Please do tell me in the comment section once the video ends which state government started this scheme. Not the center, the state government. So Niti Aayog says that koshalas are very important. They can be used for income generation. They can be used for organic farming as well. The report says that they serve other purposes as well. As per the report, Right now, India has 53 lakh stray cattle. Stray cattle means cattle that is not owned by anyone, that is not kept in any cow shelter, that is just roaming around. Those are called stray cattle. As per Niti Aayog, there are 53 lakh stray cattle in India. Now, when they just roam around, obviously, they will destroy crops. So, they have damaged crops in many parts of the country. Not just this, stray cattle have also led to many, many, many accidents. As per the government data, and government data, as you know, is always lower than the reality. Government data says 1,604 road accidents were caused by stray animals. When you are driving at a very fast speed, there's a stray animal that comes in, you put your brakes, immediately apply the brakes. There's a good chance that there might be some accident. All that can be solved if we keep these cow, these cattle in the cow shelter only. The report says that cow dung based fertilizers can have a very positive impact on the farming of the country. Not just this, this will also help the government to fulfill the obligation under directive principles of the state policy. Article 48 says that states shall take steps to preserve and increase cattle breed, prohibit cow slaughter. So this is a win-win situation for everyone. As I said, number one, this will ensure that the government of India tackles a problem of stray cattle, number one. Secondly, this will also ensure that the government of India is able to give an alternate income facility to the farmers. Thirdly, it will also help the farmers to turn towards organic farming. This will also help the government to avoid the damaging of crops. All of these 
will ensure that the government can help people in multiple ways just by building more cow shelters, just by building more goshalas. The last article for today is from the northeastern state of Nagaland. Nagaland will finally, after a long, long, long time, will finally have their civic body, that is the urban local body elections, with a 33% reservation for women. Now, this is a huge problem in Nagaland. There is a long history where Nagaland has not been able to implement the one-third women reservation law in their urban local bodies. There has been so much violence because most people in the society in Nagaland are opposed to this one-third reservation law in urban local bodies. Basically, it goes back to 2004. In 2004, for the first time, civic body elections were held under the Nagaland Municipal Act of 2001. In 2006, the state government amended the law saying that we should have 33% reservation for women in our urban local bodies. But most Naga groups oppose this. Why? The Naga group said that we have been given a special status under Article 371. The Naga group said because of our special status, Article 371, we have the right to preserve our culture, we have the right to understand and we have the right to decide how our society, how our local governance will work. Since Nagaland is a majorly patriarchal society, they believe that no, we should not give this much reservation to women. We should only have open elections. Whoever wins, we will see. There has been even the involvement of Supreme Court and the High Court in the past to have one third reservation, but that has led to violence. In 2017, there was a large scale violence. For example, in 2017, Nagaland government held elections after Supreme Court ordered it with one third reservation. There was so much violence for this election that two people in fact died and the chief minister in fact had to resign. So even the urban local body elections have had such a huge impact in Nagaland that people have actually lost their lives. The chief minister has also had to leave their position. That is why this urban local body polls in Nagaland are very, very, very important. On one hand, a lot of groups in Nagaland oppose this. But on the other hand, many women-centric groups in Nagaland do support this. Many women-centric groups, for example, the Naga Mothers Association have been fighting in favor of this. They have been going to court multiple times to implement this. Now, finally, the time has come that the Nagaland government has said that yes, we will implement this. But it remains to be seen whether the elections are conducted without any violence. In October 2021, a committee was formed by the state to review this law. Feb 2022, the Supreme Court said to Nagaland state that you should implement this as soon as possible. And in March 2022, government said, okay, we will hold the elections as per the Supreme Court verdict. Now they have said we are going ahead with the election. But again, whether it is implemented on the ground without violence, that still remains to be seen because that has not been fulfilled till now. This brings us to the end of the Hindu newspaper analysis for today. There are a couple of practice questions as always, which I would really urge you to write answers to. Number one, ongoing negotiations amongst AUKUS members hold important lessons for India as well. Comment. Second, do you think women reservation in Indian parliament would have a significant impact on gender equality in India? Substantiate your answer. I hope all of you learned a lot of new things today from this session. Do give me the answer to the question I had asked in the comment section. As soon as the session ends, you have to go to a Telegram channel to attend the quiz. If you are not a part of a Telegram channel, there is a link in the description of the video. You can click on that and join the Telegram channel. I'll see you tomorrow once again 10 a.m. with the next edition of the Hindu News Analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.